welcome to Things We Said Today, our weekly podcast about anything and everything to do with the Beatles, both as a group, as solo artists, past, present, things to come, even things from some distant future that thinks it's long ago in a galaxy far away, which is where we're going to go today. I'm Alan Cozen, the author of The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop, and got that something, how the Beatles, I want to hold your hand, changed everything, and a writer about music and musicians for the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and several other publications. I'm joined by my two regular co-hosts, Ken Michaels, who you know is the host of the syndicated Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing. Hello, Ken. Hey, Alan. Hi, everybody. And Steve Marinucci, um, probably the world's only full-time Beatles reporter. Um, you can read his work in Billboard.com and Axis.com. That's AXS.com. Goldmine, Variety, and he's the author of a book, Meet a Monkey, Davy Jones. Hello, Steve. Hello, Alan. Hello, everyone. Okay, and we're going to be speaking today with... Dan Amrick, who, um, along with his pal Jude Kelly, uh, just made – actually, well, I don't think just made. I think it's taken several years, but um, has just sort of put out onto the internet an incredible parody of Sgt. Pepper called Princess Leia's Stolen Death Star Plans. It's available both as audio tracks and as video. You have to see it with the video. And I guess I should mention the video is edited by Katrine Alk. Do we say, Dan? Yeah, K- uh, oh. Katrin Alk. Okay. And that was Dan Amrick, who will Hi. be speaking. <laughs> <laughs> but before we get to this sort of fabulous sci fi Beatles mashup, Steve, you have some news items? Well, I guess the the big thing is the announcement on June 29th uh, that uh, I think uh, Hollywood Reporter had it first that uh, Paul McCartney and Sony ATV had reached uh, settlement in the Beatles rights song rights uh, uh, question um, that had been uh, going for uh, um, a while. Oh, well, actually, he had sued in January. There's no details, and you know the only thing you can do is kind of speculate on what happened. So, but we really don't know. All we know is that they did sep- they did settle. It'll be. I mean, I assume that we will hear more of this uh, at some point uh, down the road. But for now, they they the settlement is confidential, so we really don't know what what they what they did. But in any event, um, I'm glad you know for that point that they've. Uh, settled, uh, you know, and gotten gotten this over with so that it didn't uh, run through the courts for several years. So, yeah, but since we don't know what happened, it, it's almost from our point of view as if they haven't settled. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. So, um, well, it's just it's just nice to know that these songs will be in the hands of one of the people who actually wrote. We don't songs. know that, do we? You know. No, we do. We don't know that. That's the we thing. Don't. We don't know because we don't know we don't any know. details of whether he won or lost or who gets what. And we I mean, know that they have settled. And the, the, see, that's the thing. A lot of people made the assumption on social media that McCartney got what he wanted, but there's no. I, I mean, Sony had the upper hand on this one, so there's no definite. There's no definite uh, thing one way or the other that they got that he got what he wanted. I assume he got. You know, the assumption is that he got something. Um, but I don't, yeah, I don't think he would have settled without ooh. something, right? You, you know, I mean, they wow. had, for to say the, the, that there's a settlement, there has to have been some kind of agreement that both sides could at least persuade themselves was equitable. And we know, you know, the position that he was starting from. So I'm not sure how how far he would have been willing to move there. Right. The story in The Hollywood Reporter has this quote from McCartney's attorney. It says, the parties have resolved this matter by entering into a confidential settlement agreement and jointly request that the court enter the enclosed proposed order dismissing the above referenced action without prejudice. So there's really nothing there that says much of anything. And, hmm. it, and the story even says the details of the deal are unclear. So... I mean, I assume that it's, uh, you know, uh, maybe at some point we will find out. But for now, there is no, you know, there is nothing. So Okay. Okay. Well, I certainly got that impression, but I guess, you know, we just don't know yet. 
Yeah. I think everybody wanted to have him get something out of it, you know, and everybody, uh, you know, Beatle fans hope that he got something out of it, but we don't know. And remember, too, that Yoko was not involved in this, so it's hard to say exactly where this all came right. about, you know. And oh, Yoko, Yoko wasn't involved in it because she had a separate agreement her, of, right. of her own with Sony, and it could very well be that the McCartneys have come to a similar agreement to Yoko's. Right. You know? Right. So. Could be. So, but we do not know. You also so. have news about Ringo's birthday party, which is coming up in a couple of days. Yeah, days. Ringo's, Ringo's uh, Capitol Tower birthday party on July 7th. Um, in Los Angeles, we'll have um, uh, a whole list of long list of guests. Uh, not surprised. Joe Walsh will be there, of course. Eric Burden will be there. Richard Page and Greg Bissonnet from the from the band. Uh, Edgar Winner, who uh, was in the band. Howie Mandel and Richard Lewis. Nils Lofgren and Jim Keltner and Matt Sorum and actor Ed, Ed Bakley Jr. will be the guest. And not only that, if they're going to have a, I guess they're going to have performances of Ringo songs. And one of the performers is really uh, exciting. And I wish I was closer to Los Angeles. It's going to be Van Dyke Parks, oh, who right. I would, oh. I would love to see that. I would love to see that because uh, uh, his album, that uh, Orange Crate Art album he did with Brian Wilson a few years ago was just absolutely stunning. And I have some of his earlier stuff. He's just amazing. And that, to to think that he's going to be doing some Ringo songs is really cool. So and the songs that he wrote with Ringo are very good. Mm-hmm. Hmm. So but, I would hope that he'd do one of those songs. Oh, I would assume that th- that they will. I would. That you would think so. I mean, that would make a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. So, and then the uh, the one the the one other thing. There's one more piece of news, is that the um, finally the. Uh, Change begins within benefit with McCartney and Ringo and Donovan and Cheryl Crow and Eddie Vedder and Ben Harper and Paul Horn and who who is no longer with us now and Betty Lovett and Jerry Seinfeld and Jim James uh, and others is going to finally coming out on DVD June uh, September first. It was announced on June twenty second. I, I want to make a special note to people who look go looking for it on Amazon. The listing, the correct listing for that DVD is not there yet. There is one priced at eighty nine ninety five. That is not the one. The uh, M, the uh, list price for this is fifteen ninety eight. So do not click on that eight eighty nine ninety eight thinking you're getting the one that's coming out uh, September first, uh, or at least the 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 correct pricing because that's not it. So, but yeah, it's finally coming out. It's been I know it's been on TV. Uh, it was on, I believe, it was on um, uh, PBS at one point. Um, but right. anyway, it's finally, it's finally coming out, and it's good. After all this time, good that it's finally coming out. So yeah, and, and Paul and Ringo each have their own sets, right. right? And then Ringo comes on at the end and joins Paul, right? Mm-hmm. Right. So that it's it's really good that this thing is finally finally coming out. I yep. mean, it's yep. yeah. So yay. <laughs> Okay, so oh, when, 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 I'm the list, by the way, uh, um, uh, can you remember that they do cosmically conscious? That's right. That's one of the songs. So right. there, there you go. Anyway, okay. Yeah, take I it was away. actually there. I was actually there. At you, that were that, you were that. You were that show. Hmm. Yeah, it was pretty exciting. I don't think anybody knew that he was going to do cosmically conscious. I think that was a surprise to a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, but it makes perfect sense. Right. Mm-hmm. Of course, it was something that he wrote around the time in 1968 when the Beatles were with, with the Maharishi. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it was a saying that the Maharishi said to them, mm-hmm. come and be cosmically conscious, cosmically conscious with me. Right. Well, yeah. And, and, <laughs> so, and, it, you know, and go, yeah, it goes along with the whole meditation thing, which is what that whole benefit was about anyway. So. Right. And what David Lynch has been pushing for years and years. So. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, good. Good. Anyway, go ahead, Alan. Okay, so on to Princess Leia's stolen Death Star plans, which has is, is gone. I, I, I think it's fair to say it's gone viral in the last couple of weeks. Um, you know, it's perfect timings. The the reissue of Sgt. Pepper just came out. It's the 50th anniversary of Sgt. Pepper. And Dan, uh, what is the continuing association i think between star trek sorry star wars nerds and beatles nerds 
I, that's an interesting question. I don't know. I grew up with both. So to me, they've always just been pillars of my life and my entertainment and stuff. So mm-hmm. uh, okay. to a certain extent, I've talked to a lot of Star Wars fans who know about the Beatles because, oh, yeah, no, no, I grew up with that. Yeah, my parents used to play the Beatles all the time. Mm-hmm. And so they're, you know, when they were, say, you know, uh, 7, 8, 10, 11 years old, and Star Wars is like the greatest thing in the world if you're a kid, you know, in the late right. 70s, they're growing up listening to the Red and the Blue Greatest Hits albums uh, right. or whatever it was that their parents were super into. You know, we had just gone through that second wave of Beatlemania in the late 70s. So they kind of did sort of go hand in hand. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And Mark Hamill apparently was a huge Beatles fan. Turns up at yes. Beatles conventions like as a as a visitor, not as a guest. You know. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Apparently, I saw that the, the uh, Liverpool Chamber of Commerce like knows when he's coming to town and rolls out the red carpet. Uh, I thought that was kind of interesting. Like, oh, Mark Hamill's coming. Oh, get ready, get ready. So, you know, hey, it's nice nice if you get that kind of reception. So tell us how this came about, you know, when, when you began working on it, why it occurred to you that Sergeant Pepper could be used to tell the story uh, with, yeah. with some modifications. Well, like all good ideas, it was my wife's. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> Jude and I were uh, we met uh, several several years ago, uh, late late nineties, early two thousands, playing in an eighties cover band together. We hit it off, and uh, we had always said that one day we were going to do a band uh, called Palette Swap Ninja, only because that name amused us. Palette Swap <laughs> Ninja is actually a very deep video games reference about the fighting game Mortal Kombat. We said we're going to do a band that's like an ultimate in joke to video game fans. Uh, and they, only they would know what a palette swap ninja is. And then, of course, uh, after about ten songs, doing just little goofy, little Weird Al style parodies, you know, about video games, we decided, you know, we want to do something more. We were having, we were getting good reaction to things that were narrative, like when we would tell the story of a certain game kind of fan. We did a a story song about a guy that collects arcade machines and puts them in his basement, or mm-hmm. we did a story about. <laughs> Uh, a guy who thinks he's really good at this one game, and then he goes online and he gets his butt kicked, you know, so uh, then he gets shamed. And, you know, people liked that we had characters. I said, I'd like to do something bigger. And originally, my idea, my pitch to Jude was, let's do uh, a concept album about this video game documentary called The King of Kong, which is about uh, the competitive world of Donkey Kong. If you're mm-hmm. not familiar, there is a thing uh, <laughs> uh, that is the competitive world of Donkey Kong. Oh, my God. And let's overlay that onto the Who's Tommy. Uh, because oh, that wow. was Because that was the ultimate, like, you know, well, that's, you know, if you're going to talk about narrative and rock, there you go. It kind of starts with Tommy. Mm-hmm. So I spent uh, about a year trying to get the lyrics and the story to fit and all I had come up with, the, the, uh, the star of the documentary, one of the two guys that's vying for the title, his name is Steve Weeby. So all I had come up with was, see me, feel me, touch me, Weeby. And <laughs> I couldn't get it any further than that. And uh, Jude lives outside of Boston, and I was at the time I was in L.A., I'm up in the Bay Area now. And I, I went out there for a trade show, and so my wife was with me, and we got a chance to go out to lunch with Jude. Because we haven't seen him for several years, but we've been working, you know, all this time over FTP, trading music files back and forth. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I said, you know, I'm sorry, I just can't, I can't seem to get this to work. And my wife just pops up. She's like, you guys are doing this all wrong. Like, nobody cares about the King of Kong as much as you guys do. And Tommy's a great album, but, you know, you need to take two things that people love unconditionally forever, like true pillars of our society, like, I don't know, Star Wars and Sgt. Pepper. And she (laughs) blurted it out as examples, like something like this. And then Jude and I looked at each other right in that moment and went, oh my god, that would work. Uh, Because he and I were both huge Beatles fans and both big Star Wars nerds. So we went out to lunch, and by the end of that lunch, we had the title, The Princess Leia Stolen Death Star's Plans. We had a couple of the pillars where we realized that the story would match up. It, with the the film with sort of the themes of the album and 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 where they they were and that was that was from the beginning we knew we need to do both of these in order we can't reshuffle the album we can't reshuffle the story either it works all the way or it doesn't or we're not going to bother to do it and uh by some miracle that's we we made it work it sure does um, it really uh, it yeah. really really does it's uh, it's amazing yeah 
so what what year did you start working on this? <laughs> it, either 2011 or 2012. Okay. Uh, I, I think it was 2012 when I gave up and said, yeah, okay, let's try Star Wars and Sgt. Pepper. The first two years were just spent working on the lyrics. Uh, okay. Because we realized that if we didn't get the lyrics right, if we couldn't tell the story, again, we wanted to do something narrative and something long form, the lyrics would sort of wind up propping us up later on when we were having trouble getting everything else done. We'd go back and look at the lyrics and we're like, no, that's still funny. That's no, no that, that still works. Oh, no, that's a good joke. That's a good reference. So I was sort of, I took the lead on the lyrics and I would send them off to Jude. And uh, I'm very picky about getting the cadence right. Uh, I've, I've since learned, this is not a word I was familiar with before the album, uh, but scansion is the word that yeah. poets use to get the, the, the cadence right. And I, I, I just said, no, like the, the syllables have to match up, you know, like you can't, you can't squeeze a word in and, and, and say it on the wrong syllable. You know, it's going to sound yeah. really stupid if you don't get the <laughs> syllables right. <laughs> so I didn't know that, but I heard it in other people's work. Obviously, Weird Al Yankovic is a touchstone when you talk about popular music being parodied and stuff. And, of course, his version of Taxman is finally coming out later this year. But that was something that I hooked into, and I went, that's what makes it listenable and why you want to hear it more than once, because it respects the natural flow of the words. So the words came slowly. Uh, sometimes I was uh, still traveling between San Francisco and L.A. a lot to see friends, and I would uh, my wife would drive, and I would sit there with a laptop or with an iPad, and I'd tap stuff out. And if I was lucky, I'd get maybe four lines uh, on a five-hour trip because I was really like obsessing over everything being exactly right, making the right Star Wars references, but retaining as much of the Beatles scansion as I could and, and use, reusing original lyrics when I could so that people would have those touchstones. And then the next three years after the lyrics was uh, trying to replicate uh, <laughs> uh, as close as we could everything that the Beatles did, but with two guys in their bedrooms armed only with uh, you know software, basically. So. Mm-hmm. And Variaxis, apparently. Yes, and Variaxis, and, and digital guitars that are programmed to think that they should sound like other guitars. Right. So. Okay. Huh. So I have a gazillion questions, but what we do here is we go around, you know, the circle. So I will pass you over to Ken. Ken. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Alan. And uh, Dan, I got to say, this is absolutely brilliant. Thank I can't you. believe, you know, how much fun this is to watch. I've been watching it on YouTube. And just having a blast with how you work these words into the storyline. And I think, you know, you were just talking about the work that's put into that. You know, was it really a challenge to find, like you were talking about, the syllables to make it match exactly with how the Beatles did it in their songs? And also, did you play, did, did you and Jude play all the instruments? Was it all digital? Uh, so, to, to Mr. Senator, the first uh, question. Uh, <laughs> I'll, throw, I'll throw five questions all at once. Uh, make it yeah, more it, difficult for you. It, uh, it really was uh, difficult, but it was a priority to get the, the lyrics right. Uh, because we knew that if it flowed well, then people would appreciate the story more. They would appreciate the jokes that we were doing more. And it's really not a ha-ha kind of project. It's really more of a nod and smile and I see what you did there kind of joke. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, to be fair. Uh, but yeah, like, uh, I would throw away... I mean, I, what I would do is I would, uh, I would list out every scene. You know, every song became a scene. So I had a master, like, Excel document and whiteboards. I actually have some photos of the whiteboards that I was using when I was trying to plan it out. I'm like, okay, this song is basically going to be this scene in the movie. What are the key things in this scene that need to be represented or, you know, are there famous lines from the scene uh, right. or, you know, are, is there distinctive dialogue? Uh, fixing a hole became imperial holes. And so that was one where I had a lot of trouble and I couldn't figure out how to, how to fit that into the story. Jude came to my rescue uh, and I said, you know, normally like this one is Luke is singing lead here or Obi-Wan is singing lead here. And I said, I don't, I don't know what to do. How do we tell the story of this really boring board meeting? Uh, and Jude said, tell it from the position of one of the guys that's sitting there off camera going, this is the most awkward meeting I have ever had in my life. <laughs> this guy is getting choked. I just kind of want to go back to my bunk, you know. Uh, so we, we helped each other through that. But there was a lot of 
a lot of nitpicking uh, because we felt if we didn't do this 100%, we would have a whole bunch of really angry Beatles fans and a whole bunch of really angry Star Wars fans going, you guys don't know what you're playing with. This is absolutely sacred ground to both of us. Mm -hmm. So Mm. there was no way that we were going to risk doing it wrong. So that's why we we took so darn uh, long. Um, And actually, the, the line that you used in there, I forget exactly what it was. But it matches the expression on the guy's face about yeah. the walls being all gray, you know, and how boring this is, or, you know. So it really worked in that context. Thank you. My, my wife did all of the videos. We had originally hoped that we might get some live action stuff, you know, cosplayers and folks to dress up like stormtroopers on the weekends for charity. And we reached out to a bunch of places to see if we could get a, a live action video going. And nobody bit. Uh, for a lot of different reasons, but nobody wanted to take part. So my wife said, look, I think that you should be able to watch the whole album as the movie on YouTube regardless. Uh, so I'm going to work on that. Don't backseat edit me. Uh, I'm, okay, honey, that's fine. I'm busy like trying to figure out all these little bits and pieces on a day in the life. You go ahead and do the video. I appreciate it. And then, yeah, so it, 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 I wound up adding so much but that everything that works in the video is to her credit. Um, we should be if, interviewing your wife. Is that? Is yeah, you really <laughs> should. Yeah, really. Ultimately, is that Katrine? Project. Yeah, Kat. Yeah. Okay. She, uh, she's, uh, she's in charge of all of that stuff. Okay. But yeah, uh, the second question was, did we actually play the instruments? Yes, uh, I played all the guitar and bass parts and did all of the vocals, except for Jude did the Darth Vader slash Ringo uh, <laughs> segment on Little Help. And uh, Jude also plays uh, keyboard, so he played real accordion. Uh, he played an actual uh, Gibson, uh, what was it, a G101 uh, uh, organ. So we have the same organ that they used on Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. Uh, it was rebadged as uh, a Lowry, uh, and, or it was rebadged. It was a rebadged Lowry that was uh, uh, made into a Gibson in America. Whatever it was, Jude was like, no, wait, I've got that one in storage, pulls it out, plugs in a quarter-inch jack directly into his Macintosh, and it sounds great. He goes, it was actually <laughs> sounded better than a lot of the synthetic instruments that I was working with. Huh. So huh. Uh, wherever possible, we used real instruments. Um, really, the only stuff where we didn't use real instruments was the symphonic stuff, the orchestral stuff. Uh, the clarinet is all digital except for maybe two notes because we had somebody do a clarinet, Jude's sister did the clarinet, but uh, she was a little out of practice, so we saved what we could, and it turned out being uh, like two notes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but we're like, yeah, you're, you're still in there. And my wife did some hand claps on, mm-hmm. uh, on getting better. Uh, wow. Yeah, other than that, it was just the two of us taking our time, passing stuff back and forth. And again, you know, I had the Variax guitar and bass so that I could properly replicate uh, at least close approximations of what John, George, and Paul were doing. And then uh, Jude and I sort of tag-teamed on the drums. That We used a, a digital program called um, Native Instruments Abbey Road 60s Drummer, hmm. which was uh, sampled actual vintage kits. Uh, a vintage, uh, they did two kits, actually, in like an early Ludwig and then a Ludwig Hollywood for the, for the later era. In Abbey Road Studio 2 with all the vintage microphones and gear. So we're like, well, even if we hire a live drummer, which we tried to do several times, and Spinal Tap-like, we could not get a drummer. We went through five (laughs) potential drummers. Any of them explode? Thankfully, (laughs) none exploded. Uh, But, uh, yeah, so all all the drumming is MIDI, and that's a combination of Jude and I just sort of passing it back and forth, saying, I hear a different fill, or, you know, I think Ringo's doing this, or no, this is distinctive, I want to make sure that we do that. The tabla also on Within You Without You, uh, that's a, a software instrument, and I just sort of put together real, uh, like, reasonable sounding rhythms similar to what was there, since I, I'm not an authentic Indian musician, I hate to, to break that news to anybody. <laughs> uh, so I sort of just put together a, a series of beats that sounded similar, and uh, use them like Legos and just move them around on the timeline until I found something that I thought, yeah, that's probably as close as I'm going to get. But that was all digital, too. <laughs> so um, the lead vocals, they were yes. all you, you said, except for, except for Jude on With Little Help? Yeah, every, all the vocals are me, and Jude sings the, uh, the Ringo part on Little Help for My Friend. So all the backup vocals are me, and all the regular vocals are me. I have a high voice. Uh-huh. <laughs> so... Uh, I also found that when I was in the 80s band with Jude, I'm a bit of a mimic. So I accidentally 
started taking on like when we would do a Billy Idol song, I would start to get a little bit Billy Idol sneer in there. Uh, we would do the Cure, I'd get a little bit of a Robert Robert Smith affectation to my voice. I just pulled out all the stops when we did B fifty twos and just did you know a ridiculous over the top Fred Schneider, you know. That kind of thing. <laughs> so. And I found that that served me really well. And if you're in a, in, you know, you're in a bar band just playing covers, people want it to sound like the radio. So unfortunately, that carries over so that when I try to sing Beatles, I wind up trying to pick up a little bit of John's affectations, a little bit of Paul's delivery. And then I'm mixing in a little bit of Alec Guinness when I'm trying to sing as Obi-Wan. <laughs> you know, so it, it became very weird. We didn't want it to be like a funny caricature. I wanted it to be like a blend of both what was going on with the original vocal performance and a little bit of the actor where possible. So can you, can you, uh, we can't run, we can't run a full song because of the copyright. Sure. <laughs> but can you give us a little example of the, of the voice thing? Well, I think the, the obvious one is uh, Luke is in the desert, which is uh, our version of Lucy in the sky with diamonds. We intentionally buried the lead. So you wouldn't get the, the you wouldn't, uh, the joke would be fresh with Luke is in the desert and whining. Wow. Um, <laughs> yeah. With the wah, That's... Just the back of the stuff. Um, there's, there's some, uh, there's a little bit of whining in there that I tried to do some of him. Uh, what is, I guess it's lovely Rita. Uh, where could he be? Like I threw that in because that, that's the way that Mark Hamill delivers the line. So when I realized I could do that in the song, I did it. And my wife just instantly started laughing. And once again, she's been the litmus test as a, as a huge star Wars fan and a Beatles fan. She's like, yeah, now that, yeah, you got to do that. That's, that's going to go over well. So, uh, you know, yeah, actually, I, actually, I thought you had brought that audio clip in from the film of him saying, oh, where could he be? I thought that, no, was, that, was, that was just me. Uh, <laughs> that, that happens when you watch Star Wars 150, 160 times. It sort of right. sinks in. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Mm. I think, you know, with yeah. the jokes and things, it, it was, you know, like you were saying, you, you wanted to not get anything wrong. But I think that having a little bit of irreverence in there kind of disarms people who – are authoritative about things like, you know, Star mm -hmm. Wars or whatever. Right. I mean, and there are right. so many great lines, like, I, I want those plans in my glove. <laughs> you know, that I mean, was just... one of the most controversial lines in the whole thing. Really? This was something where, when I talk about being too specific and, and really anal about getting the lyrics just so, I said, you know, I want to rhyme, no matter what, I want to rhyme love. Uh, I need somebody to love. I'm like, that's it. So... Uh, should it be – but nobody wears one glove unless you're O.J. Simpson. Nobody uh, has one glove. Why don't we – like I want those plans in my gloves because he's wearing a pair of gloves, black leather gloves. No, 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 no. You've got to keep the love thing. Yeah. It's got to be singular. I want those plans in my glove because like picture him making a fist. I swear to God, we had a two-week email conversation oh, about whether it should be glove singular or glove plural. And even when we put the album out, I said, I still don't think that joke lands. And it's one of everybody's favorite jokes. Yeah. So it just goes to show I, I was very wrong and you can be wrong even after putting five years of work into yeah. something about what people are going to connect with. Mm. Right. If he mm. got you know what the I plans, thought was... they would have been in one glove, right? He in like, glove, exactly. Yeah. Right. <laughs> he doesn't need two hands. This this is the kind of insane arguments that we had. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but my. they're fun arguments. Yeah. I suppose they're fun now. Yeah. <laughs> At the time, it was a hill I was ready to die on for two gloves. You know. Uh, wow. I gotta tell you. I gotta tell you. There's so many great lines that you put in here, but the one that, as soon as I heard it, I just my jaw dropped was when you're doing uh, Never Better, which, of course, is supposed to be getting better. And you're going through It Can't Get No Worse. Uh, wow, it just got worse. And then when Luke gets the, the lightsaber, then it's it only took one verse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was so clever. I was trying to take uh, like a, a lot of the album is in the fiction, right? Like we're not trying to break out of the story of Star Wars all that much, to the point where, I'm sure you noticed, we replaced a couple of licks and a couple of segments with John Williams themes and right, things like right. that. Think. Yeah. But that was one that made me laugh, and I was like, at some point we have to acknowledge that this is just a goofy record. You know, uh, This is just some fans having fun, so this, this seems like it's not at anybody's expense, really. 
And that was important as we, you know, any of the times where we did tease, you know, we make fun of Luke for whining, but so does Mark Hamill. Like he, you know, he owns that on social media talks about, you know, whining about going to Tashi Station and all that stuff. Uh, mm-hmm. So I've, I felt like that one, we could get away with that one and maybe you would notice it on the first listen or maybe not. And, you know, it, it would hopefully be a nice little Easter egg. But I'm, I'm glad, I'm really glad to hear that you liked that. That was, <laughs> I was proud of that too. <laughs> And the fact that you bring back the whole idea of him whining and he's leaving home. Right. Yes. Uh, well, he's leaving home was one of the most difficult things conceptually because, you know, I'm, I'm mapping out this, the uh, like I said, the scenes to the songs. And I realized I'm like, well, this is a perfect parallel. This is when he leaves Tatooine and he realizes there's nothing left for him. But this is a somber song, you know, like mm. this is not this is not like, ha ha, let's make fun of of this, you know, it's uh, arguably the Star Wars thing that we laid on top of it is even darker than than the narrative of the original Beatles song. Right. Uh, <laughs> you know, like this is like, oh my God, you're 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 the only people you've ever known are dead, and you don't know what to do with your life. So I, I talked to Jude and to Cat as well and said, you know, I think I think we're going to have to commit to telling the story rather than going for the yucks, you know. And they both agreed. They're like, yeah, like it's going to be a little jarring to suddenly become serious, but it's worth it because if people are into it at that point, then they're emotionally invested and they're going to want the story respected. And I'm kind of happy that that's what makes people cry. Uh, we saw a couple, <laughs> couple of mm. comments uh, online where people said, oh, my God, I just teared up and I didn't expect that. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, I, we didn't expect that either. But thanks for at least letting us get away with it, you know. <laughs> It's just something how the narrative just works so perfectly in the whole storyline. Right. I mean, he's leaving home is perfect at that moment in the story. Yeah. yeah. You know? So it just it's, works it's, that way. So it's a bit like that, you know, uh, Dark Side of the Moon and um, Wizard of Oz. Wizard thing, of Oz. You know? Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Except exactly. that doesn't. Except that doesn't. I, I. You know, I've never thought that that worked. Very well. This does. Yeah. This was much better than that. Much well, this was better. crafted to do that. You know. Right. So um, that's, that's a good point. That's a good point. But I mean, you had people swearing up and down about the Wizard of Oz thing and 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 Dark Side of the Moon, and there were I, I know there were DVDs made of the you know of the two together to you know pin one on top of the other, and it it just never felt right. This feels right. So that you know, for that point, you know, you deserve a lot of uh, a lot of uh, praise for doing it. You know, for for getting it right. That's thank you. So, in any mm. event, I got a question. Uh, you were just talking before about mixing in some of the Star Wars music, and I was thinking that when you had being for the benefit of Mister Kite in, in in this parody, I'm thinking that it might be really hard to duplicate the circus sounds at the very end. So what better time to put the cantina band in there and put that music in? Right. right. Was there any thought of that in, in that? Because it's more complex to work Mr. Kite in with, uh, you know, all the circus sounds. Yeah, absolutely. We, we realized, you know, if there's one piece of music that's associated with Star Wars outside of the main theme, uh, it's the cantina band. It's the song that everybody loves. It's Benny Goodman in space as well. George Lucas, mm. uh, you know, had asked John Williams to create it. And I knew that Jude already knew the keyboard part because when we would sound check at, at casino gigs and stuff with the 80s band, uh, they would say, you know, can you play like a little something? And that's what he would play. So I was just like, well, we, I know you know it and you're good at it. We got to get that in here somewhere. And when I said, you know, instead of the calliope, uh, cause I, you know, I have a sound effects library here. It's not exactly Abbey Road's depth of, uh, of, of content, but I said, you know, I'd like as a little extra thing, what if we take the second cantina band song that people don't necessarily recognize? It's the one that's behind the scene when they meet Han Solo and they start bartering over the price. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, mm. that's, that's a different piece of music. Uh, and it, that one really sounds like Benny Goodman, honestly. And uh, so I chopped that up and reversed it and basically did the same trick. But then I'm like, well, then I've got nothing for the end. You know, I didn't I didn't know really what worked. And I said, why don't we just, you know, let's just throw it away. Uh, just just end with Cantina Band because people will be like, yes, they're doing Cantina Band. You know, just for the for the fan service for for Star Wars fans. So it was a combination of Jude knowing the piece and being really good at the piece and, yeah, sort of finishing the narrative with, you're in the cantina, 
you know, narratively, of course you want to hear this piece of music at least a little bit. And just doing that snippet, it didn't overstay its welcome either. You know, like yeah. we didn't have to, and, and we didn't really take anything away from the Beatles stuff. You know, that was just sort of the experimental outro that, that they did. So we weren't replacing any core melody or, or anything like that. So it, it felt like a, a pretty safe way to, to go for it. But yeah, it was, it was, it was the best answer to the problems that we were facing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> a lot of the things that we did here were sort of like, hey, what if, what if we do this? <laughs> yeah. And then it mm-hmm. yeah. Hmm. Dan, I got, a, I got a question. Um, what, um, I mean, had, had you done anything like this before? Is this the first time you've done anything to this extent? Um, oh, to this extent, there, yeah, there was nothing this deep. We had done uh, individual, like, singles, just one-off ideas of, hey, here's a song, here's a joke we want to tell, let's slap them together. And the song that, uh, the song that we had done before, we did a version of Day Tripper called Rage Quitter. <laughs> and rage, rage quitting is something that uh, gamers do when they're frustrated and they play online, particularly stuff like Call of Duty or competitive shooting games. If you get frustrated with a game and you sometimes you literally throw the controller across the room, it's called rage quitting. Like you just get up and you walk away. <laughs> so uh, knowing I was uh, working at the company that makes Call of Duty at the time, so I was well aware of sort of the worst behavior <laughs> of Call of Duty players online. So we, we framed uh, Day Tripper around that. And that was not actually our idea. That was one of our, like, seven fans that uh, said, you know it would be funny if you did Day, Day Tripper as Rage Quitter? And I'm like, oh, my God, I don't normally like to take ideas from the outside, but, yeah, like, just that joke is enough to pin it. And then we were just like, oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy, we get to do a Beatles song. You know, like, it was, it was an excuse for us. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, when we sat down to do something narrative like this, yeah, we <laughs> – when we look back at our old songs, we're like, oh, those are terrible. Those are terrible. We, sh- we should put five years into everything that we do, you know. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, there was, uh, we had never tried anything uh, this ambitious. And, and, again, we knew the knives were going to be out if we didn't do it right, if we didn't give it all the, the proper love. It is, hopefully, I hope that when people hear it, they do hear the effort and they do hear the love because this was done with absolute respect for the Beatles and absolute respect for Star Wars. This is because we love them both and we saw the opportunity to put together at, for fun, but ultimately to, you know, Star Wars and the Beatles don't need two goofballs doing anything to elevate them, you know, culture. Right, right. It's right. Not like, well, gee, I guess we haven't thought about Sergeant Pepper's impact on our society enough. Maybe we should. <laughs> You know, oh, I'm glad these Star Wars geeks actually gave us a reason to, you know, like we knew that's not what it was going to be. It was really going to be like, oh, you think you're funny? Oh, you're going to play in these waters? Oh, you better be ready to swim. <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, that was that was part of the part of the thing is hopefully people see that the, the effort we put in was truly from a place of love and not just of like, haha, we want to get famous on the backs of the Beatles. You know, right. no, nobody does that. Has the reaction <laughs> has the reaction been completely positive? It has been 95% positive, which uh, on the internet is something that we weren't really expecting. I I expected to get torn apart. I really did. I thought that we were going to get completely hammered by people. And there were a few outcroppings here and there, certain internet communities where they thrive on negativity, where – you know, they were like, oh, this, you should have never bothered to do this. And, oh, I'm sure you think this is funny. And, uh, you know, we already have Weird Al. We don't need you. And then there was one where just everybody used the same word. And I think it was just bandwagon jumping. Disrespectful. Disrespectful. <laughs> oh, my God. This, disrespectful. Wow. I spent two weeks just listening to Ringo's drums, trying to get the fills right on Good Morning, Good Morning. What the heck are you talking about, disrespectful? You know, if it was disrespectful, we would have, you know, just crapped it out and not not thought twice but we overthought every decision and every creative choice that we made uh, which to us was the ultimate in respect but yeah uh, i mean seeing some of the reactions uh on youtube where you know youtube i'll just say it it's a cesspool uh it's (laughs) it's rare that you get positive feedback but seeing people say such uh, overwhelmingly positive things weird al should you know this is weird al quality that was obviously huge to us and, uh, you know, the, you close the Internet, we're done, we will never get better than this. And, you know, how come this doesn't already have a billion views and, you know, beautiful things like that. It was really nice to see that people connected and, and that they were shocked that we had done the whole album. <laughs> a lot of people started 
first song and they're like, haha, that's cute. And then YouTube automatically plays the next song in sequence and they went, uh, what? Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> what a colossal yeah. waste of time. <laughs> yeah. No, by the end, people are like, I can't believe that you guys did the whole thing and it held together. And oh my gosh, this is great. Thank you so much. And yeah, that's honestly, uh, we, we got a little bit of negativity, but when Mark Hamill tweeted about it, Oh, said, cool. Well, tell, uh, what, yeah. tell us what happened there. Well, okay, so we released uh, Star Wars Day is May 4th for the dumb joke, May the 4th be with you. So every uh-huh. May 4th, Star Wars fans... <laughs> I know. Yeah. Uh, every May 4th, Star Wars fans you know, post online and, and do something fun to celebrate being a Star Wars nerd. And so when we were planning this, originally, we thought we would be done a long time ago. I'll be completely honest with you. We're like, yeah, okay, this has taken us a little bit longer than we thought, but we'll get this out for Force Awakens. When the when the new Star Wars movie comes out, we're going to get it done. And that, <laughs> just, there goes that uh, that deadline. It went zooming high. <laughs> and then we're like, we're going to do it for Rogue One, the next Star <laughs> Wars movie. We're going to be ready. And that went by. And I was like, all right, look, we're not going to make Rogue One. What's the right time to do this? We've got to stick to a date. And then I looked at the calendar and I said, oh, my God. Like, literally a week apart, May 25th, 1977, was Star Wars. So that's the 40th anniversary. And then exactly one week later, it's the 50th anniversary of Pepper. That's our window. You want to be in the zeitgeist? We got to release it for that. Right. (laughs) Uh, So we just put the pedal to the metal at that point. So uh, then we had uh, some friends who were trying to help us get those videos and stuff and and my wife is is basically the third ninja at this point, as we've already well established. <laughs> and we said, you know, what if we get it out for Star Wars Day on the 4th when all the fans are going to be looking to, you know, retweet stuff and, and post stuff about about their fandom. And that way we'll be ready and primed and already in the channel so that maybe somebody will notice by the 40th anniversary and the 50th anniversary, you know, we'll all, you know, we'll, our servers will be stable and, and, uh, you know, we won't have to worry about the website crashing. Everything will be fine. And I said, okay, that makes sense. Let's do that. We put it out on May 1st. That was a Monday. And I figured like, you know what, we'll get our fans. You know, we have a small group of fans. They'll find it and they'll, they'll tell their friends and that'll be cool. And maybe, you know, we'll get like three or 4,000 views by the end of day one, if we're lucky. 14 hours later, one of the big science fiction sites, uh, io9, picked it up and then it was off to the races. Mm-hmm. So once one person did it, then overnight, everybody found out about it. May 2nd was a huge day. And then I was sort of staying up late. It was midnight on the east Co- on the West Coast, and I'm typing in, you know, checking URLs and making a little Google document. Like, we got to go back and look and see, get screenshots. This is our moment in the sun. And then a friend sends me a text and says, you got to check Twitter right now. I'm like, why? They're like, somebody big just noticed. <laughs> and I'm like... <laughs> Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, it's probably Mark Hamill. And it was because we knew he was a huge Beatles fan. So, you know, in our wildest dreams, we're talking about what happens. Like, what's the best thing that could happen? I'm like, well, the best thing that could happen was not getting hit by the cease and desist. Uh, yeah. Second, yes. yeah. I was going to ask about that. <laughs> yeah, so was I, actually. That was, that was on my I, mind, too. I, ha- I will tell you our secret. But yeah, the second best thing was we get acknowledgement from somebody involved with either Star Wars or the Beatles to say, hey, that was cute, you know, and that's all we're going to get. But Mark Hamill posts a tweet and says, the Fab Force, he he adds his own hashtag. And everybody's like, why didn't you use that hashtag? I'm like, because we're stupid. I don't know. Um, He says, I'm going to need assistance. I'm going to need help getting my jaw up off the floor. This is amazing or something like that. And I'm not going to lie. I just sat here. It's midnight. I'm about ready to go to bed. And I just started crying. You know, I was like, that was all the validation we could have possibly asked for was having right. somebody. And everybody's like, oh, now Paul or Ringo. I'm like, Paul or Ringo are not going to <laughs> notice this project. And it's OK if they don't because they have lawyers. Yes. Um, so, yeah, to, to roll straight into that, the uh, the trick that we found, we realized, look, this was started as a labor of love. It was supposed to be a project from a fan to other fans. It shouldn't be for profit. That's not the reason that we made it. We, the point was not to make money. So if we put it up anywhere, even Bandcamp, where you can say pay what you want, that's going to be a problem. 
You know, the lawyers right. get involved when they see that somebody's making money off of something they own. Right. And that was never our intent anyway. So we talked about it. We talked about what if we license all the songs? What if we license the Star Wars sound effects? That was going to be prohibitively expensive for two guys that were just doing this for fun. Thousands upon thousands of dollars. And we just said, never mind, let's put it out there and cross our fingers. Because if we put it out there truly free, just for everyone to enjoy, then the lawyers are going to be like, well, they're not taking anything from us, you know? And that's what I believe happened. Uh, when we posted the videos... It doesn't, uh, norm- doesn't normally stop lawyers, Dan. No, <laughs> and, and, actually, and actually, Dan, on, on YouTube, uh, you know, you can still get hit. Um, well, we use YouTube as our canary in the coal mine. So... Uh-huh. Kat made the videos, uh, you know, we had working edits of her videos that we were showing to friends and sharing, you know, as private lists. And every time I uploaded it, obviously YouTube said, okay, uh, this is property of Sony ATV Publishing. You can't monetize it, but they can. And I'm like, that's fine. We're not here to make money. A couple of times we put it up with so much Fox footage in order that they said, well, Fox owns this and nobody can monetize it. And I'm like... (laughs) That's fine, too. But none of the videos said, you can't post this. And I said, well, all right. That's, that's what we wanted. We wanted you to be able to enjoy the album with visuals if we could, and we can. So to me, that was the first sign, like, we might actually be able to get away with this because we're not charging any money. We're not trying to monetize somebody else's obviously extremely valuable IP. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, while good intentions are not going to keep you, I'm like, well, you know – I always love it when people do stuff like this and they go, but but I'm I'm just making a joke or but I'm a really big Star Wars fan. You know, you know, um, Darth Vader Esquire does not care how big of a fan you are uh, <laughs> if you have taken something from Darth Vader Esquire. So, um, yeah, it was definitely a risk, but I believe that by putting it out there for completely free and the fact that we did something that was ultimately complimentary, it doesn't really count. It's like the cherry on the sundae. The cherry is not going to be a satisfying dessert, but if they're not making any money and they're not being jerks and making us look bad, then we're more likely to look the other way. Mm -hmm. Um, Did get off the record reports of people who worked at Lucas owned properties who were like, uh, I can't walk down the hall today without hearing your voice come out of our everybody (laughs) everybody working on this Star Wars property right now is having a blast listening to the album today. And I'm like, that means the world to us because they obviously know Star Wars very well. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, but yeah, we were never contacted by or yet knock on wood, please. We have not been contacted by any, uh, legal entities related to either Lucas Disney or, or Apple, uh, or Sony ATV, for that matter. So we think we're in the clear, and we did something that was hopefully appreciated by fans that didn't, you know, anger anybody who had a reason to be angry. We we tried not to give them a reason to be angry, is how it we'll, would have we'll, we'll knock on wood for you. You mentioned Weird Al. Um, I've written a lot about R- Weird Al, and I've interviewed him in the past. How much of a how much of a influence was he on you, and has he reacted? Have you gotten any reaction from him? Uh, Weird Al is basically where all of my stuff comes from. I mean, Jude and I both grew up listening to Weird Al. Um, Weird Al has set the standard. Now, I I admit that I went back. My dad was into novelty records. He was a recording engineer back in the day, and uh, he also loved novelty records. So I grew up listening to the Chipmunks, to Eddie, uh, what was his name? Eddie Lawrence, the old philosopher. Right, right. Uh, you know, which is not a, a reference that a lot of people make. Uh, and I love Tom Lehrer as well. So mm-hmm. I grew up in, in high school, other kids are listening to Guns N' Roses. I'm blasting Tom Lehrer, Poisoning Pigeons in the Park, out of my, you know, my crappy 74 Opal. <laughs> so... Uh, yeah, I didn't get any dates. Um, I wonder why. Uh, so, uh, you know, how, now, about Alan, how about Alan Sherman? I loved Alan Sherman, of course. But yeah, like, uh, and, and then of course we we also peppered in things like they might be giants and Devo and 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 regular musicians who were a little uh, didn't take themselves too seriously either. So that uh, that's a lot of Jude and my influence. But Weird Al is obviously number one, just because. Nobody does parody music better. Nobody has figured out how to make something re-listenable the way that Weird Al has. And that was, that was our dream. We dreamed that maybe 
maybe Mark Hamill would notice because he's Beatle inclined. And then maybe Weird Al would notice. And then above that, maybe Paul or Ringo would notice. We have not heard anything from Weird Al. I don't normally see Weird Al comment on other people's parody works. I don't know if it's uh, just because he can't keep up with every. Because, you know, after he did it, everybody is, I'm the funniest guy in the room. I'm going to go make my own funny stuff. It's easy. And it's obviously not easy at all. So, you know, like I, this gave us a lot more respect, not only for what the Beatles did, but what Weird Al does, because we're sweating all these details that Al always gets right. In a previous life, I, too, was a music journalist long ago, and I tried to find opportunities to interview Weird Al, and I never made it happen. So I've never gotten the chance to speak to him hmm. or contact him. I would like to think that maybe because we went semi-viral and because it got some, some headlines, maybe he would have seen it. I don't know if he did. Right. I don't know if he heard it. But I figured if he did, he probably wouldn't comment publicly because it's just not his style. But I would hope that I hope that he understands that he's this is what people do who are inspired by him. We're trying to 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 honor his the trails that he blazed uh, for the last 20, 30, 40 years, too. You know, mm-hmm. another another name that comes to mind is Dr. Domeno. Have you have you? Um, yes. Have you, if you uh, to him? Jude used to always tell stories of uh, listening to his transistor radio uh, late on Sunday nights, tuning in Mm -hmm. uh, to Dr. Demento every week. And that was, I did not have a station near me that played Dr. Demento. So I grew up basically without it. But the very first package that we sent out when we finished the album, we finished the album about two weeks before we released it. Like absolutely every mix is done. I'm satisfied. Jude is satisfied. Kat is satisfied. The videos are ready. Mm -hmm. Um, we sent off uh, – you still submit to Dr. Demento through the U.S. Post. He's got a P.O. box in Culver City, and you mail him your your work on album or tape or CD. And so I burned a CD and put a cover letter in there and included lyrics and you know, sort of made a, a, a media kit, basically, for Dr. Demento. The doctor had played one of our earlier video gaming parodies two or three years ago, and we were just on cloud nine because that was our goal. You know, like as guys making hopefully funny music, you don't get any bigger than Dr. Demento. That's just it, you know? Right. So uh, we were very honored that he played two different songs on two weeks, and we were number two in requests for May. Wow. Uh, That was, uh, you know, can't do better than that. Hopefully people liked what they heard. And, uh, and yeah, in, in my dreams, Weird Al is somewhere listening in his car going, that's not bad. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow that's, that's was it fantastic. was it one specific song for which you were number two or, uh, on the uh, charts i think uh i think it was the the lead off track which we you know we we combined yeah. uh princess leia and and little help i think it was that one but he, i know that the second week uh dr demento did play uh day in the life with uh Pepper mm. Pepper, you know so yeah. he, we gave him those two the first the first and the end the, the bookends of the album because they're both super recognizable, but we gave him custom edits of those, uh, you know, songs as one track for easy airplay, and uh, apparently he he agreed. So that was good. Cool. Hmm. Wow. Fantastic. Okay. Isn't it a little frustrating though that you can't monetize it? I mean, here you have something that is, you know, very well liked across a large audience, and you are just doing it for fun, and that's the only possibility here. Well. At the same time, Jude and I both have day jobs. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, I, I work at a at a video game company. Jude is when I met Jude, he was literally a rocket scientist, uh, and he is still a a research scientist now. So this has always been a hobby for us. Mm-hmm. Uh, even when we were playing in the '80s band, sure, we would get paid for gigs, but we wouldn't get paid a lot. We we got paid enough to keep us in. You know, I want to buy another guitar, kind of money. You know. Right. Um, so it's not it's not really all that that disappointing. It made it easier. Our main goal was we wanted people to hear it. We were afraid that if we did anything that would stop people from hearing it by trying to make money off of it, then that would that would be worse. To have put five years into a creative project that we just loved doing, to just be able to go out there and go ah ah funny right? <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah. Like <laughs> all we wanted was somebody to go yeah you know <laughs> so. Um, Jude was very pragmatic about it, too. He said, you know, maybe this will open a door for us, too. Maybe somebody will go, get those guys that did that Sgt. Pepper Beatles parody thing. 
uh, we want to get the Star Wars guys in here because we're working on something else and we'd like to have them do it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, like we've, we've been invited to speak at a science fiction convention next year and we'd love to do that. You know, like that's, that's great. If we can talk about how this came about, that's wonderful. Uh, a friend, uh, actually next weekend, a friend is doing uh, a musical parody based on Raiders of the Lost Ark where it's sort of a musical potluck where mm-hmm. everybody picks a scene and makes their own song about it, whether it's original or parody. And then you don't rehearse it. You just show up and you just do it for fun. So I'm going to do that as part of that. So that was an opportunity that I might not have gotten otherwise, you know, because somebody went, oh, my God, uh, that's great. You want to be part of our thing? So we're happy. That's that's all the payment we need, you know, mm-hmm. really. Okay. Is, there, is, there something, yeah. is there something, though, um, that you – that may not even be able to say, but is are, are, is there something in the future that looks really good for you as far as you know that coming, oh, coming out no, of this? No, not at all. We've gotten no serious offers at all yet. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, it's it's, it's so, not even something that I can't talk about. There's literally nothing there. We just did this. We put it out there. People went cool, and then went back to their normal lives. So for your next project, your choice, your obvious choice would be either doing a parody version of Magical Mystery Tour, where the film you're parodying is Magical Mystery Tour. <laughs> right. <laughs> or, or coming up with something to do with the White Album. <laughs> yeah, you know, for, this, this is why I like being on a podcast with Beatles scholars, because nobody said the next thing you should do is Magical Mystery Tour until now. Everybody else just <laughs> named a completely different, oh, you got to do Revolver. I'm like, no, that's episode three. You know? uh, yeah, oh, you've right. gotta, uh, yeah, you've got to do Abbey Road to Empire. And honestly, Jude and I have talked about this, and we feel this is a singularity. If somebody else wants to try and do Empire with <laughs> Abbey Road or Empire with the White Album, a lot of people wanted us to do the White Album. And I'm like, you know, I, I love that you guys want a sequel, but if there's one thing that science fiction has taught us, <laughs> sequels don't always work out. Right. We're going we're gonna to hang our hat on this one and try different stuff from here. Yeah. I mean, I would love to be able to do more Beatles parodies. Uh, I did uh, only half-jokingly talk about doing something for Episode 3, and this was, of course, before Rogue One came out. I thought, what if we did Penny Lane to all of Rogue One and then did Strawberry Fields Forever for Episode 3 and do Mustafar Fields Forever? That was the planet where where Obi-Wan and Anakin have their final battle, the lava planet. <laughs> so I'm oh like, well, well, there you go. Yeah, Mustafar Fields forever. We just do that end scene. And then, you know, because it was all the same thing. But that's the level of Beatles nerdity that I wanted to do. And then I'm, we're like, nobody's going to care. Nobody, nobody is going to care. Nobody's going to get the joke. Nobody's going to appreciate the joke. And we've got our hands full with actual Sergeant Pepper. Maybe we don't do the double A side uh, for prequel stuff. But... <laughs> I'm, I'm still. That might still happen. I don't know. But that's that's about it. I'm not. You got gonna... to do something with Jar Jar Binks. You have to. Oh no 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 no! Please no. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, I'm sure there's something. I'm sure there's something. If we if we pull the timeline back for Episode One and compare it to the early Beatles albums, I'm sure there's something that I can, uh, I can whip up. But uh, oh I don't. God. I don't think we should. Okay. <laughs> I, I, that, you know, I, I just had to say that. That makes perfect sense. You should do the prequels and go back to Please Please Me. Right, Please Please Me, Hard Day's Night, yeah. you know, yeah. do some of the really early stuff. Uh, thanks for giving me a lot more work. I really appreciate that, Ken. <laughs> um, That's what I'm here for. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's one other thing I just wanted to point out, because apart from all the, the work you did on these lyrics, which is amazing. I don't think most people are aware of, of how much work it takes to do what you did. One of the things that I thought was really, again, I'm going to use the word clever, but when you when you had Within You Without You, which is the force within you, you took the part of the song in the middle where there's the instrumental, where you had the sitar answering lines, mm-hmm. and you used R2-D2 to talk. Yeah, I, 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 love, <laughs> I love that too. I, I thought that was one of the best parts of the album. I, I really did. Uh, That whole song was damn near impossible. Jude and I would trade off on tracks. Like when I was working on track two, he'd be working on track three, etc. And so we were always sort of complimentary. We got to a point in the album where there wasn't a lot left to do. Uh, We still had three or four uh, songs that hadn't been touched at all. And it was like drawing short straws. You know, who's... uh, 
So, uh, you want to take a whack at doing Within You Without You? Uh, no, I'm busy on... Uh, I'm doing... Actually, I've jumped ahead. I'm on Good Morning, Good Morning. There's uh, a lot of drums in there that I have to... Uh, okay, well, um, hmm, I'm kind of open at the moment, so I'll try. Uh, and, of course, you know, this is way outside of our, our uh, comfort zone as just simple, humble rock musicians. So, that whole song is basically just me. And I worked on that for about a month uh, and just did nothing else. Uh, and the R2-D2 joke, so the the main, like, I didn't have strings. And when we tried it with digital strings for the violin parts and the, uh, uh, what is it? the Dur- uh, Not Durandal. I'm forgetting the name of the Indian instrument. Sitar? No, it's not a sitar. It's it's uh, it's the bowed the one. The, yeah, Dilruba. The, Thank yeah. you, Dilruba. Yeah, the the violin style one with the drone, uh, with a mm-hmm. bow. Um, mm-hmm. And I like I could we could not replicate any of those correctly. So what that is is actually not the Variax, but my favorite guitar, which is a uh, uh, an ESP XJ6. It's got mini humbuckers in it. I love the thing to death. I put that through about five or six different guitar effects pedals until I got something that sounded vaguely otherworldly, and I played it with an Ebo which is a small uh, electromagnet that you hold over the string uh, over the pickup so that it, this magnet causes the string to vibrate so you don't have to pick it. So you get infinite sustain, which is what I was looking for for a bowed instrument. Mm. So that wound up being uh, a big challenge there. But then because I used that fake string guitar sound in areas where I should have been using a sitar as well, uh, then I realized, oh, what do we do for the call and response? And I was going to use an electric sitar to try to do that because the Variax guitar has a fake sitar sound. And I'm like, well, that's perfect. That's It didn't sound very good. And, uh, yeah, it was just a happy accident where I'm like, you know what? What if R2-D2 is in this scene? We're on the Millennium Falcon. They're playing chess. Uh, mm. And Luke is being taught the, you know, the other, the wild mysticism, which was the perfect you know, match up for, hey, here's this Eastern mysticism song and this otherworldly uh, sound, and here he's being taught about, you know, uh, forces beyond your control and, and letting yourself uh, into those those mystical energies. So thematically it worked, but I'm like, well, I'm not going to stick in stuff for a character that's not in the scene either, and we haven't used R2-D2 at all at this point in the project. So I threw those in. Thankfully, StarWars.com has a soundboard where they have isolated a lot of, uh, like, hundreds of sounds from the films and the cartoons and everything. So I just went to their website. I hooked up a digital recorder to my the output of my Mac. I probably recorded about 300 of their sounds and just had made myself a sound library of isolated, authentic Star Wars sounds. And then I started putting them together to try to get uh, conversations, you know, and, and conversational replies from R2's different stuff. So... Uh, it was a sort of, oh, let's see if this works while we were doing it, because neither Jude nor I really knew how we were going to get Within You Without You done. And we had actually considered cutting parts of it and like cutting out the solo because we're like, well, there's no lyrics and people are listening to this for the story and for it to be funny. You can't make jokes if there's no words. And yet right. we, that was the way that we found to make a joke or at least a reference without having overt lyrics. And I was kind of happy because then we got to keep the song complete as it was. I do have a trivia question for the three of you, though. I don't <laughs> know how, how closely you've listened to the album, but have you spotted the one time where we actually added a verse to one of the songs? I thought there were a couple, actually. Some of the Don't songs, we? like um, uh, Luke in the Desert, seems a lot longer than the That's original. That's the one. Okay. That's, <laughs> yeah, yeah Luke, Luke is in the Desert. I accidentally overwrote the lyrics, <laughs> and then when it came time to record it, I realized, oh my god, no, they don't, they don't, he, you know, and you're gone is not there, the third verse. Right. But I kept it because we got a reference to the infamous Blue Milk. And right. I, that w- I really, I really <laughs> argued with myself over that. I'm like, what's more important, keeping the structure of the original Beatles song exactly intact, or making a blue milk joke? And we decided the blue milk won. <laughs> Absolutely, and the Beatles fans would probably let us go by extending the verse just a little bit. It was, mm-hmm. It's only extended by like two lines, but. <laughs> Nobody has noticed, or nobody has brought it up if they if they've noticed. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, again, if you're uh, used to if you're used to hearing the songs, you you guys all know this album by heart, eighteen mm-hmm. times over. 
Mm-hmm. Those little things jump out at you, and I was amazed and a little ashamed that it didn't jump out at me <laughs> when I was writing. <laughs> it was it was kind of funny. I mean, the the couple of times that you replaced some of the Beatles music with Star Wars themes, I think fixing a whole guitar solo had some of that, and and then replacing the horn break on Pepper with. With um, I think that's like the Luke theme or something. I can't remember yes. exactly. Yes. Uh, and then um, I mean that was the one place that sounded like a slightly awkward edit, but it was great the way it came back out of it into the yeah. into the Pepper solo. That was Jude's idea to try it there, and he tried a couple of different themes, and that was the one that matched the best. And yeah, it's a little bit off, but it is also a pretty good signpost because as you start listening to the album. That's the first place where we really deviate and sort of let the listener know this is not just going to be exactly what you think it is. Right. We're occasionally going to throw <laughs> you a little curveball. So it actually it, it wound up being uh, sort of if you had gotten bored of hearing, oh, I see what you did. Yeah, you made this about Star Wars. And then you're about to tune out and then that comes in and grabs your ear. Mm-hmm. So I was really grateful that he did that. And then we just looked for other places where it could work fixing a hole. Fixing a hole. <laughs> I was practicing George's solo. Mm-hmm. And my wife came in and said, that sounds really good. You're going to stick the Imperial March in there? I'm like, no, that's the George part. I'm just having trouble with it. She goes, it sounds like the Imperial March. You should just do the Imperial March. And I went, okay, good. Now I don't have to learn that. I can play the Imperial March. I couldn't play George's part correctly. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, that was another one of those happy accidents where it was it was difficult to try to, to get my fi- – I'm not a lead player. I'm more of a rhythm player. So mm-hmm. I was learning these parts individually, you know, single serve. I would learn two measures at a time sometimes, record that. Paul's bass was particularly impossible for me. Oh, yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Where I had – you know, I wanted it to sound right or at least plausible, you know. Uh, and the official, uh, the official, uh, you know, complete scores, the giant white book for uh, all of the Beatles stuff, mm-hmm. that is a fake book at best. You know, like the, they did not sweat the details. I'm listening to it and I'm going, no, there's he's doing a completely different fill in there. There's a completely different run. He's in a different part of the neck. That the, the you know the tonality is different. Mm-hmm. And the white book's like, eh, whatever, man. You bought the book. You know, so. <laughs> So yeah, there were there were uh, at places where we felt it was appropriate or at least entertaining to deviate. We did, and yeah, they didn't all work exactly right, but they they worked well enough that it, we felt it helped keep keep people on their toes when they were listening. Hmm. Okay, wow. so I think we're running out of time, and I think, um, I think I've used I think... all of your time. I'm so sorry. We, no, no, we, no. We're, 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 this is no. wonderful. We've been having a great time. Yeah. So I should say how people can contact us. But before that, how do people contact you, Dan? Sure. Uh, so our band is called Palette Swap Ninja. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you go to bit.ly slash psninja, all lowercase, that's probably the easiest way to do it. If you go to bit.ly, uh, bit.ly uh, slash Star Wars Beatles, all lowercase. That'll take you directly to the YouTube playlist. And again, most people have said that that's the most fun way for them to experience the album, and that's great. There are links there, then back to our website. The album is available for free as an MP3 or FLAC. Either way, you can get it from our website, which is palettswapninja.com. And uh, uh, again, hopefully you dig it. My wife also did a parody of the album cover. Uh, this, uh, In addition to her many other talents, she is a professional photographer. Uh, so she took pictures of Jude and I, put us on stormtroopers, and stuck us in the middle. And uh, and we- I was I was going to ask you who who did that cover. That's a great cover. Yeah. Anything that's cool that is not the music itself is totally my wife. That's uh, <laughs> Katrin Alk wins there. Uh, so yeah, hopefully. And if if you're on Twitter and you want to follow us, we're uh, at P Swap Ninja. Uh, but again, if you go to our website, we have all of our links as well. So uh, so yeah, hopefully uh, you'll check it out and uh, and hopefully you enjoy it. How many downloads have you gotten? Do you know? Uh, yeah, we got about. I don't think we've hit twenty five thousand yet, but uh, we got twenty thousand on the MP threes and about three thousand on the FLAC, and that was wonderful. Uh, you know, I don't. I don't think that that qualifies us for an RIA award. No. Or, uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know if maybe we can submit to the Grammys this year as a as a release for best comedy album. I don't know, but yeah, we're thrilled that twenty thousand people wanted to download the album for keeps. That's a huge compliment, and we're thrilled. Mm-hmm. Okay. So you can contact us at things we said today radio show at gmail.com. Um, we also are on Twitter at things we said fab. 
and we have a Facebook page, Things We Said Today, Beatles Radio Fans. You can get to me on Facebook at Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. And Ken, how do people get to you? Uh, what have you got going on? My email address is everylittlething at att.net. My website's kenmichaelsradio.com. Every single week, there's Beatles trivia on there, and you can win one of nine amazing prizes every single week. I just want to make a quick mention that since Ringo's birthday is coming up, this coming Sunday, which is July the 9th, I just learned that there will be a Ringo Birthday Bash concert in New York City at the Cutting Room. And a musician, John Montagna, that some of you might know, he's worked with Todd Rundgren and Alan Parsons, He's going to be putting on a concert. It's all Ringo music, Ringo solo music, Ringo with the Beatles. And it's this uh, Sunday night. I believe it starts at 7.30. I might, just might have a pair of tickets to give away through my website, which, again, is KenMichaelsRadio.com. Okay? Okay. And Steve? Um, you can get a hold of me at BeatlesExaminer at gmail.com. I have my own Facebook page where I talk about music and other things. And there's a uh, Beatles news and information page that I run where I post strictly about the Beatles and a lot of, uh, you know, uh, Beatles-related stuff. And you're welcome to join that. Um, that's about it. Uh, Dan, I just want to say this has been wonderful. Thank you very much for, yeah, thanks. for coming. And, and yeah. this has been really uh, – we've done some – some good shows, uh, you know, in the past. Uh, this is really one of my favorites now. Uh, you, you were great. And so I just want to say on behalf of everybody, thank you very much. And good luck with this, really. Uh, I hope uh, you have much continued good luck with this. It, it's and very I, deserving. And thank I hope you. it does lead to other work, similar work. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Uh, it, I mean, that, w- that would be great. Obviously, Jude and I are just doing this for fun. But yeah, on behalf of Jude and I, thank you so much for having me on. I'm sorry Jude couldn't be here, uh, but uh, we would, you know, he uh, he appreciates that I also uh, sort of lean into the Beatles a little bit more, I think. So <laughs> uh, it, 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 well, thank you very much for having me on. It was, it was a blast to hang out with you guys. You're welcome. You're okay. very welcome. Great. So for Steve Marinucci and Ken Michaels and this time Dan Amrick and Jude Kelly and Katrine Auk. This is Alan Cozen saying thank you for listening and we'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.